a lot of people said that it's in your network. Like you need to share what you're doing with people, you know, and let them know like where you want to go with this. I was like, oh God, like, what does that mean? Like, I have to go on social media and like talk about myself, like (laughs) promote myself. It's like my nightmare. (laughs) Um, because this, this is this thing that happens when you have a a dream and you're moving towards it. It's like, you want to protect it. And and when you share it, then you make it a little more vulnerable and and the haters might come and then you got to get like, you might get negative energy and all that. So, um, I ended up pushing myself to do that. Sharing what you're doing with the world is actually a really great idea. That's what I learned. (laughs) It's scary. It's terrifying, but like your courage builds, I think, the more that you do it. What's also cool is finding out there are a lot of people rooting for you. <laughs> like there are actually a lot of people who want to see you see you win. Um, and that's really humbling and, and encouraging. I have a journal of self-advocacy wins that I started um, in the last, whatever, during the pandemic. So just anything from telling a colleague, yeah, I don't have capacity to do that right now to like, (laughs) you know, putting myself out there um, with clients or, you know, delivering certain content that was scary or having scary, uncomfortable conversations. Those all count as as self-advocacy win. So when I feel freaked out or anxious, I'm like, okay, wait, I've done this. I, I've done this in some different forms. Like, okay, it can happen. Uh, I'm a very like playful person. I like smiling a lot. I, I like peace <laughs> a lot. So just on an internal level, that was tough. That was- Welcome to this podcast where you're gonna learn the strategies, the tactics, and also gain the confidence to speak your mind unapologetically at work and in your career so that you can get ahead faster, you can have more impact, be a better leader and be respected as yourself authentically. And I'll be your host, Evna Curry. I'm the CEO and founder of AssertiveWay.com, INSAT MBA and a Forbes contributor. Now let's get started. It's so good to have you here, Zahida. Thank you so much for joining to share a little bit about your experiences in this podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for for inviting me. I'm excited. Yeah, so am I. So why don't you start off just sharing a little bit about yourself, who you are, what got you into diversity, equity, inclusion inclusion space, your motivators, your passions. My motivators and my passions. I think from a young age, I've always hated bullies like conceptually that never made sense to me like why are people picking on others because they're different and then you know kind of learning about various forms of discrimination and microaggressions but not having the language as a child it was just fascinating to me and so I gravitated to um, a lot of social justice spaces as a teenager and I guess that drive or advocacy kind of continued throughout my education. I thought I was going to be a professor of African history and um, actually did not love the PhD experience and (laughs) what that lifestyle was about. Um, It takes a lot to get through the PhD. I mean, it's not for, it's it's You have to be in it, mind, body, soul. (laughs) And I I was not into it, my body, soul at all. Um, And so what I found was instead, I connected much more to helping the people for for whom like universities of that caliber were never designed for, helping them navigate that. Um, and that turned into a 10 year plus career in what we now know as diversity, equity and inclusion. But I guess the the summary is. I love social justice. I like helping people feel empowered to um, stick up for others and respect others and affirm others. And I credit that to my parents, my family, but also my hometown of Seattle. Yeah. And you've been doing so much in this space, not only your job, but writing content on it and you have your own practice on it. You have so many things going on. Thanks. Yeah. It's, you know, 
it's been a journey. I, I love sharing with people that I am the daughter of an author. So writing has always just kind of been in my my blood. And um, what started as an outlet for myself and just exploration kind of turned into freelancing about culture and gender and belonging and being an adult in a world that changes every 10 seconds. So yeah, writing, writing is a part of me as well, for sure. And being a consultant now. So yeah, (laughs) so many aspects. So I always like to, um, to ask a few questions that show a little bit about your experience and, and how, you know, as a, as a, as a black woman in the U S who is actually taught teaching and helping other companies um, have more diverse inclusion. Yeah. I'd love to learn more about your own path um, in your own career. I mean, clearly you're super smart. That helps. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My career path. Yeah. Uh, I think those, specifically those jumps that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, your coordinator, to a director, to then to director. Yeah, um, I would start by saying <laughs> my career path was kind of ambiguous and, you know, free for me. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have very clear steps and goals along the way. I think I just wanted to take roles that were interesting to me and that freaked me out a little bit, but in a great way, like terrified me (laughs) because I I knew they would stretch me. Um, And I knew that on some core level, um, you know, I want to build communities. I want to give people those skills and all of that. Uh, But I also slowly along the way got to figure out what I really value in positions. And once that got more crystallized, I would say within the last few years, then I had a clear understanding. But taking it to the beginning, it's starting from the beginning. So yeah, we'll, we'll go back in time. Like (laughs) when I was 26, I think I I left my PhD program, which was its own kind of like quarter life crisis in and of itself. um, Because I had been told like, oh, you know, you're smart. You like reading and you like writing and you like your research, (laughs) like go to school, get your PhD. Right. Um, So breaking from that was tough. And my first role, because after I decided to leave that program, I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing with my life now? Like, what <laughs> what kind of jobs will I get? What is the career going to be? And so I was applying to jobs like crazy. And when, when I say that, it was like over 50 jobs that I applied for that summer. <laughs> and I noticed pretty readily a pattern. Um, I was gravitating towards positions in multicultural recruitment. That's what it was called at the time. Now it has much shinier names, Uh, but multicultural recruitment or um, retention for domestic students of color or first generation college students. And there were a few kind of international cross-cultural exchange kinds of programs. And so I landed at a, a very small liberal arts college in very rural Ohio. And I was there for four years. I started out in admissions, recruiting, um, again, those black and brown students who are first gen or or low income. Um, And then by the end of my time there, I was asked to join a, an expanded and revamped office of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, So I was on the retention side. And then from there, so I love that experience. Um, Ohio, was actually probably (laughs) one of the experiences where I grew the most in life. Surprisingly, I had my own stereotypes and judgments a thousand percent about it, but I was around really fantastic students and faculty and like the colleagues I had were just incredible. So um, I was in in that school or at that school for four years, I said, hey, this is my graduation. (laughs) Let's see what's next. And I kept seeing these positions pop up in the corporate world um, outside of academia, right? So they would have like coordinator of diversity inclusion, you know, program manager, this and that. And I was like, huh, 
well, first of all, these salaries are way better, um, but also they're doing some interesting things with employee resource groups or like sponsorship programs and all that. And I'm like, well, I don't really know the employee experience that well, um, but it seems important. <laughs> and, you know, I've had some lackluster experiences, like maybe I should give this a go and see if corporate is for me. And even that initially was kind of a a tough question to wrestle with because, you know, by nature, you know, I'm from Seattle, kind of, kind of hippie, kind of liberal, <laughs> you know, whatever. And I was like, oh God, you know, this might just crush all creativity within me <laughs> because that was the image I had of, of corporate. So I ended up at a law firm as a coordinator of diversity and inclusion, and I was working under the director. Uh, this was a relatively new department for them. They were kind of new-ish to those conversations. And I ended up being there for like a year and a half. <laughs> and I think around six months, I was like, mm, I don't know about all this. Like, um, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was being given the the opportunity to really kind of hone my strengths and learn other things in the way that I anticipated. Whereas my boss really was looking more so for an executive assistant. Um, and that was not it <laughs> for me. So I had a lot of frustrations and, um, the best thing from that experience that I could never take away was that it made me kind of get comfortable with data in ways that would not have happened um, had I stayed in those roles in higher education. So pivot tables were my best friend all the time, <laughs> like creating these presentations um, for the C-suite all the time and doing client surveys and all the requests for proposals and, and all that. So it kind of gave me a new language to, to utilize. Could um, you uh, share, talk a little bit more about that? Um, because last time we talked, you mentioned that data, uh, the language of data, you yeah. thought was an important language yeah. for um, the African-American community or in, in, in other groups. I don't know who else you recommend that for. Could you elaborate a little bit more about that? I'm from, I come from the data world. Yeah. Oh, I'm super <laughs> interested in what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm coming from liberal arts colleges and in those environments, people are all about the anecdotes. It's all about, oh, you know, I had this student and they were just full of potential and they got the opportunity and they just, you know, <laughs> they really blossomed and all that stuff, right? Or, you know, we launched this program and it didn't have the support that it needed. And so X, Y, Z happened. Um, <laughs> whereas I think working with people, um, at a law firm, it was like, all right, what do the numbers say? And I don't want to, I don't want to mean it, uh, in the sense that no one in higher ed or no one at liberal arts colleges cares about num numbers. That's not true. Um, but I think the intensity of emphasis was just very different. Um, I think the data points were the entry to the conversation, whereas maybe in uh, liberal arts settings, it's it's more, you know, humanistic and more touchy-feely and, and we want the feel-good moments and all of that. Um, and so when I talk to different people, whether they're their colleagues, whether they're students, whether they're clients, and they are black or brown, or they are underrepresented um, or have been historically excluded because of their gender identity or their economic status, et cetera. It's like, okay, you have your goals. You want to advocate for yourself. And a lot of us culturally come from backgrounds where the story is kind of everything, <laughs> uh, right? Like even kind of how we tell stories, it can be cyclical and there's dips and there's <laughs> rises and, and all of that. And that's cool. And we need to keep that because that's valuable. Um, and we do need to hone another skill, which I am very clear. And I, I know you and I had this conversation. It is like a tool of 
I don't, I don't know, institutional oppression in a way. I don't know if we're going to get that deep, but um, <laughs> institutional data is the language of these companies or of these schools. And so, you know, we're trying to have as many tools in our, our, our toolbox or our toolkit as possible to make the changes that we can for ourselves um, and for others along the way. And I think it wouldn't be fair to pretend like it's a good idea to ignore data because it's not to me, to me, others can disagree. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. I'm, I mean, my background is all engineers. My mom's an engineer. My dad's an engineer. My brother's an engineer. I'm an engineer. So we kind of grew up in that data world. I, yeah. I'm not as much of a <laughs> creative. Um, and, um, but I, I find it interesting you say that. Um, I thought it was very interesting for our conversation. And I, I would, anticipate that a lot of people who hear this might feel like but that's not me like why do I have to change I know (laughs) (laughs) exactly so so what's what's your what would you what do you what what would you say to those people like what's your perspective on that yeah um yeah it shouldn't be your role right it's not it's not fair if it were up to me i I wouldn't have a whole lot of data (laughs) going on but i think there's ways to kind of strategically use it to enhance whatever goal you're pursuing so i'm not saying like okay now everybody go (laughs) spend 30 minutes a day practicing you know your what are the lookups? The V, <laughs> the v lookups and H lookups. Yeah, like I'm. Let's not do that. But think about um, different different data points that could support your cause. Um, you don't have to go into the deep end of research. Uh, but I think on a general level, and and I don't think there's biases to this. But I think on a general level a superior or your, your boss, your supervisor, whoever you are, are wishing to make these changes with, uh, and who has a little bit more power than you, they appreciate when their job is made easier. So if you're able to paint a picture of why you deserve that raise, um, by showing, you know, I mean, it could be just simple things as many, as many people as you've served demographic, like the number and right, like, and where that population is going in the future or something. Um, If you're able to just paint that picture and keep it actually kind of simple for them and see, make it easy for them to see like, oh, this is a great idea. I need to take some action on this, then the better that you'll be. So yeah. Is it a little bit extra work? Yes. And can it help you reach your goals too? Also, yes. That's like the answer nobody wants to hear, but that's, <laughs> that's my answer. Well, you know, this, this is a place where we share ideas that sometimes people don't want to hear, but they yeah. get to choose. If these are ideas, and again, everybody has free will to choose what works for them, but at least uh, the ideas out there, I thought was it was fairly, fairly interesting, yeah. and I want to get into microaggressions. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, uh, and yeah. if you'd be willing to share what you experienced and what you learned from the situation, and maybe what you did, what you think you did well, what you think you could have done differently. Yeah, this this was an interesting kind of reflection because. I think there is probably a lot of things that I've experienced, but just kind of blacked out uh, or like, or like blocked out of my memory. And I also think it's, it's a bit complicated because as I've progressed in my career, like going from, you know, when I stepped out of academia, like going from a coordinator to an assistant director, to a director, (laughs) like of a department, and then a director of um, DEI for a whole school it's an interesting position because like you're the diversity person you're like the expert so no people are a little more on their p's and q's around me now so i haven't experienced as as many um blatantly but the one that came to mind after uh thinking this over for a few few minutes was early in my career so this was my my first job um and it was a kind of split position which was really wordy. I was an assistant director of admissions 
um, slash <laughs> director of multicultural recruitment. So it's like, I kind of had um, some director directorial power with the um, the recruitment aspects, but in the scheme of that office of admissions, I was a newbie, I was a rookie. And so I was out with white colleagues for drinks and dinner one day after work. And we were talking about some of our prospective students and an older white female colleague started talking about a black male prospective student. And she's going into, you know, oh, you know, he's such a great student and his story is just so compelling because, you know, he's like a lot of young black men and he doesn't have a father and this and that. And somebody was like, uh, yeah, he does. <laughs> like, <laughs> he totally has a dad because he talked about it in his essay or whatever the case was. And it was this weird like moment where <laughs> like, you couldn't quite hear a pin drop, but it was very awkward. And again, like this was my first real job and I'm, I was kind of young and really not super confident yet. Um, and so I wasn't sure how to, how to speak up on that. Um, and so I, was talking to a close friend at the time about what to do and like really, really struggling. And I ended up reaching out to two of the white female colleagues, two other white female colleagues who are present because I was, I was slowly hearing more about like, you know, bystander intervention and how to like enlist others to help you and support you and all of that. So I emailed them just kind of my, observations, but also how that, that experience made me feel. And I didn't want to be perceived as the angry black woman, um, or being aggressive and calling out this woman. And, and so I was like, so I'm really just asking you as kind of allies, can you help with this? And both responded and both responded, no, that they would not help with that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, they, and they were like, you know, we think it just needs to come from you and it would just be better received. And, and, you know, you need to share your true story and all of that. And at the time I was like, no, I don't want to do this because <laughs> one in my role, like, I feel like I'm calling these things out all the time anyways. And this was my spare time. Like this was my personal life. Um, I don't enjoy doing those things in my personal life actually at all. Uh, and so it was just super disappointing. So that is the story that came to mind <laughs> first, which was like, I tried to ask my white peers to help and they didn't. Um, and it was, it was frustrating. So I think now that I've had more professional experience, but also just life experience in boosting up my confidence, I think I would have handled it differently in the sense that I would have approached that person privately another time to have that conversation um, and let them know how it made me feel and, you know, what my hope is moving forward. Um, And that's all I got on that. And how would you, because feelings are something that a lot of people, most people, um, find it very hard to describe their feelings. They find it very hard to identify feelings. So generally there's like, everybody has like a repertoire of like five feelings, happy, sad, angry, bored, mad, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, What feeling, I'm curious to know, what feeling were you experiencing then? I think in that moment, oh gosh, you're really like making me go back there. (laughs) You, you can use one of the five words. No, no. <laughs> I think in that moment, I was, um, I was a combination of feelings. I think I was stunned, honestly, like on a, on a physiological level, it just felt like, wait, what? Like, I think I was confused. I think I was disappointed. I also think there was some sort of like embarrassment in the sense of like, wait, this is what you think of Black people? Like, none of us have dads. Like, it was so easy for you to go there. Like, what? And so, like, a part of that 
maybe, maybe embarrassment or maybe shame was also maybe disgust as well. Um, like insulting, somehow. insulting for sure. For sure. That, that is a much better word. You know, thank you. <laughs> I think I felt it definitely was insulting as well. So yeah, it, was, it was wild. And even though it wasn't directed at you, it's because it's, it was like indirect. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So like you're talking about this group, this community, this race that I belong to. And you're not talking about me specifically, but I'm here. <laughs> and like it's in a it's in a it's it's in this casual kind of slight of a way to put us down. And I know that's not what she meant but it was weird. <laughs> it was, it was insulting and it, it felt like a put down. Mm, yeah. And, it, and it's interesting because it, it, it's, there is that um, stereotype happening and this, you know, she was just saying stuff, like you said, she, she probably didn't intend it that way, Yeah, but it, it certainly came across that way. And I, I like what you said that uh, that you would have approached her one on one um, nowadays and uh, explain how you felt. I think just by explaining how you felt yeah. and why you felt, I think just that would have helped her see and not yeah. do that again. I would like to think so. <laughs> I would like to think so. Yeah, I think like anytime anyone makes a misstep. I've just learned professionally taking to taking them to the side, like having a conversation that's private is a much more constructive approach. Um, and also just letting them know like where you're coming from. I think had I had the opportunity to do that over, I would have liked to express like, hey, we have a good working relationship, you know, I've enjoyed getting to know you. We're trying to approach these goals together here in the office. And I need to let you know how those comments made me feel. Um, I'm not, it's not like a, because, okay, I do want to make this point quickly, <laughs> if it's okay. I do think with white people in particular, there's a, a really embedded knee jerk uh, defensiveness that can happen when you do point out their missteps. And so kind of um, emphasizing the, the behavior, right, the words that were said, or the actions that that they took, um, and making it very clear, you're talking about that, and we're not getting into character and labels of you're racist or not, like, that's like a never, you're not going to win that battle. And it's a waste of time. <laughs> so that's how I would have handled it. Mm, that's yeah I think that's that's perfect what you just mentioned I think that's very true and it actually reminded me um I'm married with an African-American man and uh we we kind of moved to the U.S. together uh kind of recently so we got married and we we met each other abroad nice. so these things never really came up but then oh, when we were yeah, yeah. Okay. when we got here and then you know the Black Lives Matter yeah. movement and other things and we started talking a lot more about it and and I think I, I probably said some things that hurt his feeling, like made him feel like you felt. And very accidentally, which is interesting, but he had to educate me quite a lot. Man. Um, because some of those things, and I, I don't consider myself a white woman. <laughs> yeah, true. This is interesting. Um, but I, I can see because he he explained to me so much about the background and the and, and all those things that you're talking about, like, you know, the, the, the stigmas and things that um, he has to experience. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. No, thank you for sharing. Like, what a time to move to the U.S. <laughs> during Black Lives Matter 2020. That had to be intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's an adjustment. A lot, a lot of things happening um, in that period, right? Well, you know, COVID and everything. Does your company champion women? Maybe that's a woman's network, a woman's club, a woman's initiative. Well, my friend, if it does, I'd absolutely love to be able to add value to that cause, be it with a talk, uh, an interactive activity, or even a workshop. 
We can cover things like how to be an assertive woman in the workplace without coming across as aggressive, breakthrough conversations for breakthrough careers for professional women, and all sorts of other empowering topics. If you know of any such clubs in your company or your team, please contact me at info at assertiveway.com and we can then talk more about how I can support the women in your company, in your department, in your team. What was a very courageous moment that you had? Like, and what motivated that courage? And I say courage, which... And by courage, I mean, normal you would not do it. Didn't, you didn't instinctively feel like doing whatever you did, yeah. but you did it anyways because of something else and other motivation. Yeah. I think the biggest courageous moment, I love these, like you have the best questions. <laughs> um, it was a really cool experience just reflecting on this. My most courageous moment was creating my own business as a Oh my gosh, tell me about uh, it. That was tough. And it's I still have moments where I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? Why like <laughs> who am I to even be in this space thinking I can help people in all these ways? Like, um, so I say it was courageous because for a lot of my life, and even now, like I'm still kind of challenging a lot of the messaging from society or from, you know, of colleagues or from family about what my life is supposed to be um, and what it's supposed to look like. And for a lot of a lot of people, this was certainly my experience, like you go from A to B to C and like it's supposed to be a straight line and it's supposed to be smooth and you don't make you don't take too big of risks and you know you make responsible decisions and and all these things so uh sharing that I wanted to be a consultant with people in my life I mean I think this was probably was like late 20s um when I first started thinking about it and and learning about it little by little um because by then again I was in the early phases of my career so diversity, equity, inclusion was still taking shape, but I would have these experiences at work where an external consultant would come in and, you know, give some presentations and get paid pretty well. (laughs) And I would be sitting there like, okay, I could have did a better presentation. (laughs) Like I could have designed a better workshop than this. Like what, what is going on here? I don't understand. (laughs) Um, And so that was always, always like really frustrating and weird to me. And I think over time I was able to intentionally make sure that the people around me, like my closest friends or, or, you know, people I was dating were, supportive. Um, and even if they, they couldn't understand the ins and outs of what I wanted to do with consulting, they were still encouraging. And so I have to give one of my, my closest friends, who's like a little sister to me, Candace, give her a shout out because, um, along the, around the time we became friends, I think I was, who knows, I don't don't remember all the career paths. I'll just say early, (laughs) early thirties. And um, she was just like, you know, so what's going on with this consulting? <laughs> like, why don't you just, you know, why don't you build a website? Why don't you start there? Because I was just like, there's so much that I want to do. I'm so overwhelmed. I don't have a mentor. I don't know where to start. <laughs> like, to, like, giving a whole bunch of excuses. I'm just like, okay, just do this, do this thing. Like, j- just focus on that. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so that was the beginning of just making really small but attainable goals that that led to bigger goals um so right got the website then the next courageous scary thing was like okay any clients though (laughs) how did you get your first client um it was it was funny so i am at my core a researcher i will read all the books and all the articles about how to get clients, right? <laughs> and so oh. what I what I was finding was a lot of people said that it's in your network. Like you need to share what you're doing with people you know and let them know like where you want to go with this. 
I was like, oh God, like, what does that mean? Like, ugh, I have to go on social media and like talk about myself, like <laughs> promote myself. It's like my nightmare. <laughs> um, because this, this is this thing that happens when you have a, a dream and you're moving towards it. It's like, you want to protect it. And, and when you share it, then you make it a little more vulnerable and, and the haters might come and then you got to get like, you might get negative energy and all that. So, um, I ended up pushing myself to do that and social media. That- so like posting on social media, what you're up to. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much I think um oh the way I did it okay I haven't thought about this in a while the way that I did it was this was when I was more active on Instagram I have since I think I've made like one post this year because I just it's too much um but I did it I was doing these different reveals on my Instagram stories like I have a big announcement for everybody and, and it was like counting down in different posts and then I would give different hints like no I'm not pregnant no <laughs> you know it's not- your creative side coming out all those just, creative juices it was so silly um and so people were sending in their guesses and then the reveal was that I launched you know launched my business and so that was that was actually the first thing and then if I'm not mistaken that led to a former um former school that I worked with someone from from there reached out and was like hey we need some workshops can you do this and then I just kind of would post more and more over time um and then former colleagues from other places would reach out and then they would introduce me to potential clients and then boom 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 so sharing what you're doing with the world is actually a really great idea that's what I learned (laughs) it's scary it's terrifying but like your courage builds, I think, the more that you do it. I totally relate. I, for me, it was so hard because I, the same, I mean, it was hard to make that for that decision. And then later to start posting and letting people know, cause I thought they're going to think I'm the silliest person ever to try to do this. And, and I thought, and I had to tell myself, listen, even not the right people, even if only 0.01% of the people relate to what you're posting, that's okay. That other 99.99% don't matter. Yeah, no, that's real. And I think what's also cool is finding out there are a lot of people rooting for you. (laughs) Like there are actually a lot of people who want to see you, see you win. Um, And that's really humbling and, and encouraging. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I love that courageous moment. Well, various courageous moments to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any last thoughts for the audience today? It's, it's a process. Be kind to yourself in in the process of whatever your journey is. It's really easy for us to get overwhelmed <laughs> by everything that there is to do. Just remember like you're probably doing this for the first time and it's okay. Like (laughs) you can, you can figure it out. You have what you need. Just keep taking, taking the steps that you can. Um, it's a rewarding journey and all of that courage. Like I said, it, it builds over time. I'm still building mine in 10,000 ways. Um, but you'll, you'll come across a lot of great people along the way, like Ida. So (laughs) just keep going. Thank you. Wow. 10,000 ways to build your courage. That's commitment. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't even get into this. I have um, I have a journal of self-advocacy wins that I started um, in the last, whatever, during the pandemic. So just anything from telling a colleague, yeah, I don't have capacity to do that right now to like, <laughs> you know, putting myself out there um, with clients or, you know, delivering certain content that was scary or having scary uncomfortable conversations those all count as as self-advocacy wins so when I feel freaked out or anxious I'm like okay wait I've done this I've done this in some different forms like okay it can happen that is literally the best way to end this interview with this idea of the (laughs) self-advocacy journal people Get yourself a self-advocacy journal. Yeah. I am all for that. Not, 
it it builds your courage it builds your self-confidence it lowers your you said it lowers your um overwhelm yeah it, it reminds you what you hear what that you've done it before that you can handle it i love that and it's so easy to forget so i like visual reminders <laughs> just to keep going and you see it every day put it somewhere where you know you can't miss it yeah on your desk like on the side where exactly. you put your coffee your coffee mug <laughs> exactly all right well thank you so much for sharing so many wonderful experiences today yeah of course this is my pleasure i'm so delighted that zaida joined us to talk about some of these real issues around microaggressions and to give very specific examples as well that was a gift to all of us so here are some of the things that she shared and i thought were great takeaways so the first one she mentioned it slightly but i want to give you a conclusion around it was that when she was applying for her first job she applied for more than 50 jobs and she mentioned that through the application process, she discovered what she gravitated towards. So she discovered a little bit more about herself and what she liked based on those interviews. That can only happen if you also leverage these interviews to understand more about the job. So that's something that I always like to incentivize people to do. Interviews are not just about the interviewer interviewing you. You're also interviewing the interviewer, the company, trying to get to know if they are a good fit for you. So leverage that conversation to get to know, to ask questions, to reveal to yourself, is that a place that you would like to work with? Is that industry or is that function something that you would enjoy especially if you haven't been there yet you're starting your career out it's a great opportunity to ask questions and to get to know the company more the more questions you ask the more time you spend with people in the company before you you don't you get a job or when you're applying for jobs the more you'll make a, a good choice that you won't have to regret later waste you know a year or two to realize that that's not for you and the second thing that she shared was about data, right? When she got a job at a, in a law firm, she realized, you know, her being from a liberal arts background that over there, it was all about the data. It was all about the numbers. All the conversations happen around numbers. And that's not her past, right? Her past is more, what she studied was around stories and anecdotes. And interestingly, she also said that the a lot of the African American community or other communities really value stories and she says keep that that is super powerful but also add some numbers to your arsenal so that you can communicate as well with um, folks who maybe have a different background she thought that that was unfair but important to do and that's how she approaches her work as well um, another great topic that she mentioned was I think the essence of the interview as well which was handling microaggressions microaggressions not to her but also to the people that you know she represents or that she's with you know represented by which is for in her case the african-american community when you know this uh, a woman said this guy did, did great given he has no doesn't have a father and that was not true the fact that she felt and I love how she really described this so well, her emotions and her feelings. She says it made her feel stunned, confused, disappointed, embarrassed, disgusted, insulted. It felt like a put down. And she spoke up and shared the right information with them. And she shared how she felt. You know, here's the thing. People will, won't uh, disagree with your feelings. Your feelings are so yours and they're human experience. No matter what the background of the person, we humans, we know what the feeling of disappointment is we know the feeling of in being insulted we know the feeling of confused we know the feeling of embarrassment and that is a shared human experience what we can disagree with is the argument so she says that she explained the situation and this woman still did not understand her argument she you know sometimes there are cultural differences the fact is she wasn't able to understand the argument or to accept the argument but she can relate to the emotion and the fact that you know zahida expressed that she felt these emotions for the other person to think oh well you know i know those emotions they're not great and if this person is feeling this because i said this then maybe i shouldn't say this anymore 
even if they don't really understand the, the cause, but at least they're thinking, you know what, I, I don't want to cause this sort of feelings to other people. And, and therefore, I'm going to change my actions here to prevent that from happening. You know, that, that's a possibility. So here's uh, the other situation she had with a colleague who was using personal writings from a black and brown personal essays in a stereotypical, stereotype way uh, for fundraising. Um, and she said she brought it up. She had a, a one, pulled out this person, had a one 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 conversation. And she said it was spicy because um, she had to tell her that the woman, you know, was wrong and she she shouldn't do that right she needed consent and it, and it was offensive so she stood her ground and she did she was able to protect the students she might not have been able to convince the, the the woman that she was doing something wrong but she was able to at least stop the issue from happening with with the students one thing that she shared is the power of one-on-one -on -one conversations she says it's a lot more constructive when you pull people one-on-one -on -one, have these conversations because it's such a a delicate topic and she says when you point out missteps when you point out someone is doing something wrong they can get defensive which is very true and when people get defensive it's really hard to get them to change and so even if you're right the problem is if the other person gets defensive is your chances of influence go by go down you know down the drain and that's unfortunately not going to serve you um, and whoever you're defending so she said, make it clear it's about, you know, the situation. It's not about labels. It's not about them uh, being a racist or uh, lacking character. So I thought that was really good because when people feel attacked, then they're not going to be collaborative. They're just not going to be collaborative. Um, you want them to understand your perspective and you want them to then shift their behavior. The best way of doing that is having, just like she said, those one-on-one -on -one conversations around the topic, the issue. She also mentioned that her most courageous moment was starting her business. And this is something that a lot of people would relate to. She says, it's the, the challenging messaging from society, colleagues, family about what my life is supposed to be and supposed to look like. And a lot of people struggle with this at some point, right? When they're starting their careers. I struggled with this um, at many points. Like I want my career and my life to look a certain way. And a lot of people will not agree with the way I want to see, want, want to conduct my life. It's your life. I, I know a lot of people that you know go through this, the, this, this challenge. Like their parents want them to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, or they want them to get married and have kids, or they want them to do certain things, buy a house, like whatever it is. And, and not just the parents, like society in general. Everybody's doing that. You there's this certain peer pressure to do things in a way. Like she said, you don't take too much risks. You follow the path. You do the responsible decision thing. And she wanted something new. She wanted to be a consultant. That was a big decision for her. And that was hard. Not because it was hard to make the shift for herself. It was hard because she had to go against the, the messaging from society, from colleagues, from family about what her life is supposed to look like. But at the end of the day, sometimes people are not telling her what they want her to do sometimes it's just this perceived notion of what people are expecting right the way people react to you like you don't want to uh, end your life like a lot of people <laughs> in their life and their top regret is i regret not having to live the life that i wanted to live to have the courage to live my life versus living the life that people expected me to live right who wants to have that regret every day of this life is so precious so I love that she went after what she wanted in her 20s. She also said these words, she says, I have to go on social media and talk about myself and promote myself. This is a nightmare. When she realized that she had to promote herself online, she said, this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. And a lot of people and a lot of women might relate to this. Self-promoting is a nightmare. If, do I have to self-promote to get ahead? This is a nightmare. No, it's not. We need to shift that thinking. We need to shift that thinking. She says it works. She says it's a good idea to do that, to self-promote. She started to see results when she did it. That's how she got her first client. We need to get more used to self-promoting and not make it feel like a nightmare. She learned that by actually taking action and doing it. So it's more normal for her because she's done it. She's seen the results and now she can talk about it.
And I also loved her journal of self-advocacy. I think that's so great. She says it helps her many times when she has self-doubt, when she feels overwhelmed. She just goes back to her, self, her journal of self-advocacy wins, times when she spoke up, times when she did things, she was decisive when she took action, when she advocated and stood up for herself. That makes her feel powerful and courageous. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful practice that we should all start doing. So guys, I encourage you to start your self-advocacy wins journal as well. That was a fantastic, brilliant idea. All right, my friends, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Feel free to check out some of the other interviews that we've had. I'll link some of them below, some great interviews. And again, if you have a resource group in your company for women and you feel like a training on self-advocacy, on speaking up skills, on having these hard conversations would be valuable to them, be it a, a workshop or a talk or anything else, let them know about our podcast in a sort of way or get in touch with me at LinkedIn. You can message me anytime or with my email, even on curry at assertiveway.com or info at assertiveway.com. Let's work together to bring a training or a workshop or a talk to your resource group in your company. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next one. It's been an absolute honor to serve you today and remind you that you can check out the show notes for this episode on my blog at assertiveway.com slash blog. And do you want to go deeper on how you can speak your mind with confidence at work? Unapologetically then, go watch one of my several free trainings at assertiveway.com slash free because in those trainings, you're going to learn the skills that you need to speak up with confidence and without being rude, like how to say no, how to express your ideas in meetings, how to express how you feel, how to ask for what you want, ask for that promotion that's due, deal with difficult people, difficult conversations, handle criticism, give thoughtful, constructive criticism to your team members or others, to self-promote without bragging, and much, much more. So these are the kind of skills that your parents, your teachers, your bosses may not have taught you, but that are going to make all the difference in the world in your career, in your relationships, and in your happiness. Trust me. So thank you once more, and go ahead and enjoy the day. Have a delightful, wonderful week.